Hi, this is Ross Payton here with Roleplaying Public Radio. This is RPPR, episode 57, Read the Fine Print. Of course, with me, as always, is Tom Church. To watch your face in the Annunciation, it's, it's like seeing poetry in motion. All right. Uh, all right. Thank you, Tom. I never I, uh, know what I, to make of the, the, your little Your eyes are so comments. dreamy. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh, anyways, we're back. Uh, we Take are, that, motherfucker. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we've been doing quite a bit here behind the scenes RPPR uh, AP wise. We've uh, just posted some playtest uh, playtest. I done. I, I have uh, recorded of the uh, Wild Talents game I'm going to be running at uh, Gen Con this year. Yeah. I partook in one of them. Uh, yes, yes. In fact, the one that uh, I posted on there, I posted two playtests in one um, session. The third one we posted in a few weeks. Um, let's see here. We're still working on, I'm still, of course, focusing on zombies of the world. Uh, buy the book, man. Buy the pre-order the book. Now, uh, the books are on their way. They're being shipped here from seriously. Singapore Ross, to... like Ross's bookie sending him some really bitchy phone calls. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Me and my, my women's lacrosse gambling habit. Uh, lose the habit, man. <laughs> I can't, I just need one break. I just need one break and I'm back in business. Anyway. Um, You'll see on this, uh, I have embedded episode one, Migration, uh, and I'll be, every week or so I'll be posting a new episode for Zombies of the World, so check that out. I also, on the Zombies of the World blog, have uh, started writing up a series of posts talking about behind the scenes, how I created Zombies of the World, uh, how I came up with the idea, how the web series was created, how the book was created, uh, how it ties into role-playing public radio, and all kinds of fun stuff. So if you're a book nerd, uh, like mm. you probably are since you're at a tabletop RPG podcast, so you got to be a nerd for... Yeah, Some kind of books. There, there are credentials you have to have. Yeah. Um, then uh, check that out. Uh, let's see here. Of course, oh, also, uh, The Ruins of Lemuria PDF is well underway. The the text is being proofread by Thad right now. Uh, and the art and layout is being done by Ian Moody, of course. But if you are an artist and you would like to contribute, volunteer some art for this PDF, uh, email us at rpprpodcast at gmail.com or leave a message on the forums or on the Facebook page. Or send me a tweet mm-hmm. at Twitter. Uh, my user, you know, Twitter thing is Ross Payton. Of course, follow me on Twitter. Yeah, uh, he's been working hard. I came in here. He had a visor on, smelled of mimeograph fluid. He is busy. Yeah, typing out something. I'm. I've built my own lineal type machine, and we'll. we'll and I'm, that's what we're doing it in. Is it movable type? It's yes. It's lenotype. It's a very great advance in the field of typography. Ross is the Paul Revere of yeah. the zombies. Well, it was eighteen eighty eight to nineteen sixties when they were popular. Um, there's a documentary about Paul it. Revere was Paul Revere. We'll get that in, uh, Paul Revere about, lived to 400 years old. Uh, we'll talk about that in the shout outs. Uh, there's actually a cool documentary being made in Springtown, Springfield, uh, in Springtown uh, about Linotype. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, because the person who made it also uses Kickstarter like I do for RPPR. Uh, let's see. So any other, of course, Tom has a bit of news, uh, personal, I guess, uh, that will, he'll talk several letter. He has a personal experience he'd like to share. So you yes, might want indeed. to give a little hint to the listeners. Um, ow. Yes. Just uh, ow. Okay. So you don't want to spoil it. You want to leave. No, it no. That you got to you got to power through this episode to get there. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, be I mean, intrigued. What what yeah. happened to Tom? Also, also on your uh, zombies of the world thing, there'll be uh, also the other the other uh, blog going yeah. on. Uh, yes, Tom is going to be uh, uh, authoring some blogs written from the perspective of a New England ghoul named Byron. So, yeah, uh, in the sanctuary itself. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, what is the sanctuary? What is going on? Oh uh, well, you need to read Zombies of the World to find out. Oh my God! You should pre-order now. Get a free poster. Otherwise, you will be uninformed and lost. Yes. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then will... they'll put you on the list. <laughs> There's a list, apparently. Uh, you so, do not want to be on that list. I, I guess not. Uh, it doesn't sound pleasant. It's not. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, for this episode, read the fine print. What are we talking about? We're talking about game design. Uh, in this I episode. know you're saying we've talked about game design before. We have. But not this. Yes. Uh, this is this actually... Uh, the idea for this episode came for me from playing two games Tell recently. Tell us a story, Ross. Yes. <laughs> uh, first off, you know, in the last episode, I talked about Mansions of Madness. That was one of our shout-outs. It was a board game uh, put out by Fantasy Flight Games, the same people who did Arkham Horror. And it's a very well-made, you know, it's like a $90 board game. It's very well-made with all these crafted miniatures and cards and a, a very complex board that you it's not like meant for a quickie. With us. yeah no it's a very long complex game and at first it's a very fun game but the i've played it like four or five times uh since uh that last episode or total uh actually yeah i've pre- pre- played through at least 
four scenarios. Uh, and we've lost every single one time. And not like by a little, like by a lot. And the way it looks like, I just can't see how investigators can win except by luck. You know, and by but, a sheer huge fucking margin. Well, if the if the opposition, there is one player who's like the keeper who is pl- controlling all the monsters and everything. He can, if he's a total dumb fuck, uh, then the 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 investigators can win. But investigators move very. Sl- There's two things. One, investigators are very slow, and two, investigators have no real way to get their health or sanity back. Um, and once you're dead, you you can come back, but you know. Uh, the main thing is each scenario has like a clock on it. You know, like there's you have only so many turns before everything you you lose. I mean, almost before, always you know. before Cthulhu shows up. Yeah, things keep getting worse the longer you go in the game. Anyways, like the the keeper gains new ab- abilities. Uh, other things happen. Um, investigators can also only move like two or maybe three spaces. Per turn, and three is only if they do nothing else. And the boards are usually set up so that they're at least 10, 12 spaces long or wide. So it takes five or six turns to get from one side of the board to the other. And usually these scenarios require you to go to one place, then another place, then another place, you know, like three or four places. And it's just very hard for me to see how investigators can win. Uh, and also the fact that they never regain health or sanity means that, you know, you're just going to die, you know, three fourths in the game and then your new guy's going to be too far away to do anything. So it's just judging from everything I look in the red, I just can't see how investigators have it even, a, a, you know, they only have a very slight chance of winning. So but that's not very apparent at the beginning. Um, and the other game was Revenge of the Titans. It's an indie little tower defense game. Um, it's got very great graphics, very good. This is a video art. game. Right? Yeah, it's a video game. Um, you get it on Steam. Uh, I got it part of the Humble Bundle last year, and I just played through it once since it showed up on Steam. Um, the only, the problem is that each level you get oh research one new tech item and all right fine and then there are little tech trees um the thing is new enemies will show up and say oh you need uh the x-ray in order to spot the ghost monsters and to shoot them but the x-ray needs like six items to uh, tech items to research in advance uh before you get to it so if you don't get that tech tree by the time you get to ghosts you're fucked um and the game gives a very like it doesn't even explain what the tech items do before you research them like x-ray physics or particle beams or you know physics or uh optics or alien psychology or medicine yeah but it doesn't tell you what they do until you actually can click on them yeah that, that's into, bullshit yeah i'm sorry no i am calling bullshit on that right yeah now. you don't even get to figure out what the what route you need to go in order to do this so like i got to level 40 in the game and I got to the point where I needed, like, missiles or something like that, but there was no way. I was like, I'd take it a really bizarre, or apparently, uh, the wrong tech tree route. And so I couldn't get missiles without replaying, like, eight levels. Like, you know, you can't just reassign tech. You have to go back and replay that level and then replay the next level and blah, 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 blah. What the crap? Yeah, exactly. So it's like I went to the Steam forums. It's like this is a bad game design decision. I don't like this. Well, you can just replay the levels again. Well, or I can not like, play um, the game again. Like, I played the levels and I won. Yeah. I shouldn't have to do them again. Yeah, exactly. And um, the fact that you can get paint, you literally paint yourself into a corner. Well, not literally, but paint yourself into a corner. And be able to, uh, without having to replay a large section of the game, you know, is, well, a really horrible game design flaw. So I'd avoid, I would, I'm giving the opposite of a shout out to, for Revenge of the A shout down. Yeah, shout down. Thank you, Tom. I'm here. Um, That's what I do. And so these are game design flaws that are not immediately apparent. I mean, there are game design flaws that are very apparent and you like give you a big warning sign. It's like in nature, you know, bright colors on a, a frog mean I am poison. Do not eat me. And then in role playing games, you of course have the great example about palladium, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, what was that about the IQ or whatever? Yeah. The, uh, the fact that your IQ is rolled up randomly, but there is no penalty for having a low IQ. Yeah. So I, and I believe a chimpanzee, has an IQ of slightly higher than 30 for a human average. Yeah. Yeah, I know of course I know I mentioned that I rolled up a character in, in Heroes Unlimited that had it that had an IQ of 3, which is basically an IQ of 30 and rolled up medical doctor 
but had no penalties to his skills with medicine, despite the fact he was slightly less intelligent than a chimpanzee. Right, the fact that you can even roll a character with a 30 IQ. I mean, that's kind of like the game design equivalent of, I am poison, do not play me. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you are going to have problems with this. Uh, or like Fatal, Adal Circumference is a random table of character generation. When you see that, you're like, Thank yeah, you. I think uh, I think I'll skip this. Thank you for warning like, me, game. You know, like no, I think I read before this might be a red flag. Yeah, exactly. It's a red flag. Anal circumference is a red flag. Nipple cue color. Huh? IQ of thirty yeah, is a red cue. flag. Yeah, in a game for that is just ridiculous. And, so, uh, or another great example: the uh, revised he- Heroes Unlimited. One of the powers was alter physical structure plasma. Yeah, which means nothing short. I mean, cold attacks will do double damage. But you can essentially incinerate anything. Yeah. The amount of damage you inflict is so ungodly, you know, it is huge. Yeah. You can essentially melt concrete by touching it. Right. Yeah, or the uh, invulnerability power. Right. You take no damage from attacks. Right. So, and then... That's never good to have. Right, and the, uh, another major power was that, you know, major powers are all considered equal to one another. The other one was what? Clock control? Like, just literally. No, there's it? major and minor powers. Oh, I see. That was a minor power, but yeah, clock manipulation. Yeah. Not time manipulation, clock manipulation. Yes, and which they say, like, yeah, I mean, they gave, they actually had to include some examples of why it would be useful, like a bomb, like a bomb on a timer. Like, yeah. okay, fine. But if, if you. If I'm made of plasma, I'm not worried about a bomb anyway. Or if I'm invulnerable. Yeah. If I'm trying to... I'll like, just eat the bomb. <laughs> like, or if it's a case like you're disarming a nuclear warhead, just like, well, this could, like, two wires. Well, this could either be, this could really be good or really suck. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just dumb enough to find out. <laughs> nice. Um, that actually happened, by the way. Oh, uh, nice. But you see, the, so the, the whole point we're, we're having in this whole discussion is that there are game design problems that are, there are two types. You know, the very obvious one, the Palladium ones. Fatal. Fatal. And then there are the subtle ones, the Revenge of the Titans, Mansion, and the Madness ones. The ones that are, at first, the game seems fun. I mean, Revenge of the Titan, I played for 40 levels. I put several hours into that game. And then Mansion's Madness, I did play four times. I've put probably put six, eight hours or yeah. more into or like, that game. Or how about Old World of Darkness? Um, well, yeah, so... Uh, uh, our main point is that in role playing games, you can face the same problem. With if you're looking through a system and then you see like Palladium, like oh well, you know what you're dealing. You either if you decide to play Palladium, you know you're playing a fucked up system. Yeah, well, we, when we did the uh, t- uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness game, yeah, when like and uh, everything will be rolled randomly. Just this is gonna really suck. Right, right. And um, But that's why we played it. Yeah, exactly. We knew what we were getting to. But it, 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 the question is, it, no role-playing game is perfectly balanced. There's always going to be, like, some flaw in it. I mean, there, nothing is absolutely perfect. Um, I know there will be plenty of arguments. Like, no, my system is the one. No, system. mine! Um, Stellar Moon is the best game of all time, you know. It's like, uh, you are full of crap, sir! Yeah. So this is this is our uh, but Uber nerd usually voices. you know whenever you're playing a major game you know or some game that you want to play you'll find later on in the campaign there's some crippling game design flaw that you didn't anticipate and now you're in the middle like four or five sessions in a campaign you're like oh shit what do I do now you're talking about uh, World of Darkness yeah, old uh, world specifically old world like actually basically uh, version I think it's I think it's a second and third edition primarily yeah old is, world of darkness yeah was um well I mean mage I could just Essentially, with mages, you can do anything you want if you have the spheres for it. Right. But that's pretty. That's another thing that anyone looking at that could see. I could see how this could be a problem. But another one is, but one of the ones that is not is celerity for the vampires. Yeah, the vampires. Yeah, they each had their own superpowers. Their superpowers just deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, one I, was I, celerity. Yes, I will speed. actually. I will mention this for for a friend of mine who said yeah. this before. Yeah, in first edition, it actually really was about personal horror. That being a vampire is a horrible thing. By by third edition, you're undead superheroes. Yeah, that's all. So celerity, what did it do? It essentially, it's well, it's there. It's like, all of this is trying to uh, recreate stuff vampires have done in movies, and right. Well, and this was basically their uh, super movement. You know, moving, ex, you know, in, ex, increasingly fast. Which, not a bad idea. But what they did it was essentially for every every dot you have in celerity, you got an additional, you know, action, action in combat. And if you have Five in celerity, you're gonna be doing five actions when everyone else does one. 
Well, six, really. Oh, they, yeah, six. Plus yeah, because you, you plus your standard. So. Um, so the thing is, that's not a very uh, apparent flaw if you're not a very experienced GM or you just don't realize it, especially at the beginning of the game when everybody only has, like, a few dots of power. So, like, maybe your guy, yeah, you know, like, your you know, Tremere only put one dot into it. Or, I'm sorry, not Tremere, Toreador only put one dot into it. So he Slayer. has, like, one extra action. And you're like, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's good. That's not too bad. I mean, because Toreadors Tori Tori aren't known for being, you know, yeah. big combat monsters. So, so at first... It, Everything's fine in the first few sessions, but then let's say a few games later, uh, you give everybody n- enough experience, and suddenly he resyncs all of his dots into celerity, and suddenly he's you know five dots fucking badass, uh, and suddenly so, you realize, and you don't even realize until the one combat. Oh man, this is gonna be a great mini boss fight. They're gonna affect this gang, and there's gonna be ghouls and blah blah blah. And the guy says, "All right, I attack. I make six headshots. Oh, I made them all because I have super speed. Boop, you know, and mm-hmm. then." Uh, you're like, no one else has even acted yet. And you're like, oh, shit, what do I do now? Because, you know, everyone's established. It's been five or, sessions in the campaign. Actually, or, like, personal experience. Someone, yeah. was, it was a four in celerity. Actually, that we were, and we were, you know, they were, we were going up against a group of um, hunters. Yeah. And these were like, you know, like, not, well, we're still vampires versus mortals, but these are supposed to be, like, well-trained hunters. And there, and there were four of them. So he basically got, you know, he got a free dodge on every, every attack they made. And then still had one left over to basically attack with impunity. Right. And it... And the hunters all attacked him, so the other players could act. Was it it just the one vampire versus all the hunters? No, it was... No, there was a group of three, and the rest were doing our own thing, but with that, and like, we... It was never a question of who was going to win. Yeah. There was no... I mean, the thing is, and occasionally having a fight really go in your favor, just... It's it's cool. Yeah, sure. But when it's the third fight you've been and you've just you're annihilating your opposition. Right. Or it's one player yeah, doing that. Eventually it just it loses its meaning like, wow, we won again. Yeah. Boy, it's a good thing we got in that fight and risked our lio. Who cares? Yeah. So there you go. I mean, the game design flaw wasn't really apparent, but then you're like, oh shit! Now, yeah, things are starting to suck. I never mind when we get into when we get into the lower generations or the the Elysium book for playing elders. Yeah. I can't. We tried. I think we tried to do. We actually. Uh, Jason tried to run a, run an elders game. Yeah. And we were unstoppable. Yeah. Um, although that was right at the beginning. I think Jason just wasn't set up for Elders. Because that's, that's really hard to do, to be fair. An old World of Darkness yeah, Elder Vampire game. But uh, yeah, I know like one of us had like a potence of six. Yeah. Which essentially, whatever you hit's going to die. Yeah. Um, now, the thing... Uh, 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 the, but this is also a very common game design flaw. Uh, because the, the idea of multiple attacks... Um, because this isn't unique to the old world of darkness. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Old, uh, old versions of Shadowrun had this problem with wired reflexes in the light, uh, and the like. And then, uh, uh, 3.0, 3.0 dungeons and dragons, the, the original haste, it gave you an extra standard action, which was huge. It wasn't, you know, like tremendous, you know, third level spell. Like, Oh, I can double my character's effectiveness in combat. Basically. um, I can cast two spells per round instead of one. Uh, I can move and I'd make two full, you know, two attacks. Mm-hmm. What or, I, uh, yeah. I asked another one for a 3.0. Yeah. I know I've mentioned this prestige class before. Right. But the shifter from, uh, uh, I think it was Heroes of the Wild. Yeah. It, you know, essentially, I mean, it looks just kind of a pretty cool. It's like, oh, you know, kind of a, kind of a shapeshifter class. If you don't really, unless you re- re- actually read it, by the time you get, you, you have to be level 15 to get it. So by the time you're level 15, you have you have 10 levels in that. You can become anything that has 15 hit dice or less. An unlimited number of times per day. Right. When I, I actually got to do that once, and there wasn't a fight we couldn't win. Right. I could just become whatever this thing's most vulnerable to. Right. Um, now, uh, of course, the main thing about haste, though, was because it was so easily accessible. A third yeah, a third level, level spell, spell, yeah. That, that was available to some divine characters and all mages. Uh, that it literally became mandatory after a certain point. You needed either a magic item to give you haste, or the cast haste, or haste potions. Yeah, couldn't you uh, cast haste on other player members? Yeah, of course. Too, so yeah, so you could eventually get everyone in the group has right. It. And so that became mandatory. So that's sort of the definition of unbalance, where something is so powerful, everyone has to take it. Then yeah, you realize you have something unbalanced. So um, the question is: so the the multiple taxing is a common like major flaw in a lot of systems. Um, so the, and, but it's not usually immediately apparent if, uh, if you're just learning a system, for example. 
Um, you're not going to pick up on all that subtle or all that, you know, the implications of the rules. So the question is, you know, you're playing a game, you find out there's this game design flaw, you know, uh, speedy, you know, fangs, the, the badass vampire, the slayer, is wiping the campaign with everything. And if you make ba- fights balanced for him, it'll kill all the other players. And if you make fa- fights balanced for the other players, you know, speedy he's, he's just going to kill everybody. Yeah. Um, so what do you do? Uh, so there are a number of, uh, uh, possibilities. And so we're going to talk about them. Um, you know, obviously I think the first one is to stop playing the game. Yeah, Do we, do we, do we just want to push the button right yeah. now? Like, like, it's like open up the football, enter yeah. the launch codes and hit the button. <laughs> yeah, just right. cut the game off. Yeah. If it, it, certainly if a game well, it works better for video games. Well, yeah, obviously like Revenge of the Titans. What did I do? I uninstalled Revenge of the Titans and I stopped like, playing. Take that, bitch. Yeah, it's like, I, I, I have I'm not other, beholden to you. Yeah, I have other... Uh, I guess you did hit the button. I guess the delete button. Yeah, yeah. Delete local content button. Thanks, Steam. Um, Anytime, Home Slice. <laughs> <laughs> you're not Steam. I was answering for them. Oh, I see. Uh, so for a role-playing game, that, that may, if especially if you're right towards the beginning of the campaign, you realize there's more than one issue. If you're like, you didn't realize how bad Palladium was, or you were tricked into playing Cinnabar or something, and you're like, oh, shit, what do we do? I will actually give new new gamers a pass if they just started Palladium and didn't realize. Yeah. But if you're any experienced gamer yeah. with any an inkling of Palladium and you don't realize it, yeah. you need to fire the captain of your brain shit because he's drunk at the wheel. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, there's a, a, a I think that's one thing is just to, to just pull the plug and, and start over. Uh, of course, you could always try and port the, the campaign into a new system. Uh, no, always you know. do, usually doable. Yeah. Uh, especially, you know, uh, if you're finding in the similar genre type game, uh, so like old world of darkness to new world of darkness uh, or, uh, like, you know, or, uh, D and D to Pathfinder or fourth edition. Right. Yeah. Yeah. From 3.0 to Pathfinder to fourth ed or fourth ed to Pathfinder or preferably iron heroes. Cause iron heroes is better than Ross all likes iron heroes. It's pretty baller. Um, or like, you know, mutants and masterminds to wild talents. Or- yeah. Exactly. Um, now, this isn't always po- the nuclear option. Isn't always advisable because if everybody, you know, that's all the books that you right. have. So we're like, great. What are we going to do on Tuesdays now? Yeah. Um, or if you can't port it over, nobody wants to change. Uh, then you have to deal with the system as is. And so there are a couple of different ways of dealing. And one is obviously the, the social contract. So right. I mean, if your groups, if your groups close enough, you should be able to. Okay. Yeah. You know, I I've I've been in the. I think we might have done that a couple of times. But just the group's like, okay, um, look, this thing is just fucking us up. Yeah. So, uh, it's like, all right, come on. Get together, brainstorm, figure out a solution. Right. Go. Um, and, like, ideally, it's, uh, you don't even have to change the rules. You could just say, uh, Speedy, um, your character's all f- kinds of fucked up. Can you reallocate your points to something else less, you know, asshole you know, and then just yeah. hope that he uh, changes his character? Or how about just like, okay, uh... Like, how about that? Yeah, the haste spell, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that. Well, that's the next thing. Um, that's house ruling. Like, the first thing is social contract, which is just, like, dealing with the players and not touching the rules. But the other thing is obviously the great tradition of house ruling, uh, which is pretty much uh, every group house rules to some degree, um, I think. Uh, and that's that's one way of house ruling is just remove the offending rules, uh, uh, excise them, and remove the offending power. Now, By the way, yeah. Um, you, you, you all get it when I actually tell my story, but all those things you just, all those words you just said are really kind of funny. Yes, they are. I'm sorry. You'll, uh, you'll all find out later. Yes. So uh, that's, that's certainly if it's like one ability, like one, like in the haste, it's just one spell. Well, just get rid of the spell and you're fine, you know. Uh, just have the player get, you know, something else. Hey, you get fireball or something, you know. Um, but on the other hand, what if it's like, wired reflexes or something you know very uh uh built into the character built into the system something that is uh harder you can't just remove the initiative rules you know you can't just totally rework them so what do you do for that and then obviously you can try and adjust it you know sort of balance rebalance the scales right um tweaking the rules to um yeah either favor other solutions or weaken that solution now of course the problem with with a, a balancing the scales if you're doing it in the middle of a campaign then it's kind of like you know multi- mmo uh patch notes like mm-hmm. oh my god they totally nerfed this class oh, oh yeah I've, I've i've played world of warcraft yeah i played star wars galaxies i 
greatly have heard all of this. Yes. So that's kind of like it's preferable to turn, try and deal with this as far away from the rules as possible, as early as possible and away from the rules as possible. So like group discussion is better than house ruling is better than, you know, uh, patching the game at, in the middle of a campaign, I think. Because uh, if Speedy spent all his XP on, you know, Celerity, and then you weaken Celerity, and especially if you don't let him rebuild his character, then he's like, fuck, he's, he's, he's gonna a gimp. Be, he's going to be useless or he's going to die. Yeah, or, or he's both. not going to want to play. He's just going to quit the campaign. Um, and that's not fair either. Uh, so you can, it, 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 it's hard, it's a little harder to do. And also, there's a possibility that your new rules will be just as unbalanced as the old rules. Uh, you know, you say, oh, well, Celerity does this, Haste does this, and people are like, oh, well, if Haste does this now, then I can do something else totally balls to the wall and say, you know? And then, you're like, and then you say, fuck. Yes, exactly. And then uh, uh, you can't just keep patching the game, too, because players will just get confused. Eventually you have to realize, dude, you know, I can't put any, like, eventually just, there's too much, so many patches on the shit. It's just broken. Yeah. Um, no more glue. <laughs> no more glue. Um, now, the other thing, of course, uh, you can be a little more smart, you can be a little more adaptive and be more like, you know, have the game evolve around you. For example, in D&D, if haste is so fucking powerful, why doesn't everyone use it? So the players figure out, oh shit, haste is really powerful. Well, guess what? The NPCs start figuring that out, too. Then everyone is haste. Yeah. yeah. And once again, I, as I've said, before, as I just said while we were planning all this, and when everyone's super, no one will be. Yes. As, uh, Thank you, Incredibles. Yes, yes, yes. That is a movie out there. That is. It's a, a movie. Um, it's not a shout out. It's, I mean, I mean to be fair, Tom. I uh, to be honest, I I never like understood why the the super villain was so bad for wanting to give everyone superpowers. I mean, like. Well, you, you have flight. read uh, like Earth X, haven't you? Uh, no, I don't remember. That's the one where everyone on Earth gets superpowers. Yeah, that's a Marvel thing, though, right? And that's oh, like, that's true. Yeah. From the 90s? Yeah, I think it was from the 90s. Yeah, this is 90s Marvel. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, seriously, I, I I I would want consumer superpowers. I'm not... I'm shameless. I, like, I want my jetpack. Where's my jetpack, Tom? Or just your ability to fly without it. That would be sweet, yeah. Of course, that would mean, like, thousands of people die sucked into jet. And of course, why would there even be, like... That high up. Yeah, yeah. There's no air up there. Yeah, it's cold. Yeah. And radiation. <sighs> Fucking radiation. I know. Well, I don't know. Well, it depends. Uh, if we're talking about, like, 1960s radiation, then it, it's awesome. <laughs> Gamma rays, yes. Like, radiation um, does whatever you want it to. So, I, I, I think that's kind of the, 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 the key here is, one, trying to find a metagame solution first. Uh, dealing with the people at the table um, and like trying like one one common solution is just have the person rebuild the character to something comparable but not like totally unbalanced I think we um, actually did that with uh, was it I forget who it was, was in, a, in a, the Wild Talents game but they had like it was someone that it was a it was Bill's character when he when he was playing. Well, he just retired that character after his first session, yeah, you know, and then played someone else. But that, that's just, it's along the same lines. It's yeah. just realizing, okay, yeah, this character is just way too yeah way too bad um, eh? yeah there that's a yeah there there it requires a lot of finesse especially with universal systems like wild talents or mutants masterminds uh where you can do whatever you want build whatever you want with those points and then you're like oh shit i built something that's really really powerful or really really weak like hey uh, I, I accidentally stumbled upon a combo here that can't be beat yeah so it, it, it's so house rule if you have to, but I, I tend to avoid doing that to solve one specific problem. Because you also have the metagame problem of the player in question who gets, you know, nerfed by these rules. Being like, oh, well, that guy's just being an asshole to me, you know. And yeah, but I think you also need to determine if he made it, you know, if if he made that character and didn't know that, you know, that it was way overpowered or he did it on purpose. Yeah. Like Dan, like Dan, like I would not believe he would ever do something like that no. mistake in D anD. d He yeah. would have been like, "Yeah, Dan, I know you're R J. Yeah, or R J. You know, he same thing. It's like, well, um, but you, if you came up on some combo for your fighter that was unbeatable, I'd be like, I, and you said, "Oh, I didn't realize that." I'd be like, "I believe you, Tom." Now they said like, but of course, if I say like, "Look, I rolled a nat twenty, or I was like, "Sure, you did, Tom." Yeah, no, that, that well, yeah, of course. You know, that hurts. Well, you you should stop rolling so well, Tom. I will not apologize for art. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I think that kind of uh, 
gets over most of the ideas with that. I mean, well, I know we we barely yeah. scratched the surface on get design flaws or what the various ones right. there are. But I mean, yeah, that, there's not that, enough hours in the day for right. Me. I mean, that's a huge topic in game design: what is balanced, what is unbalanced. Um, and you know, the, the the everyone can think of the obvious flaws, but it, it takes a while to realize that the it's it's not those flaws that are going to fuck you up because you can always avoid it, uh, avoid that game. It's the Flaws you don't realize are really bad until like it's too late. Um, and that's usually how you, that's often how you get like different versions of games. Yeah, like you know, you know, second edition or third editions. Right. I I actually I enjoy to go back. I've you know like I look at the fir- like first edition of a game versus the second edition and see if it's some of the stuff I I noticed. Yeah. A lot of the times like they saw it too. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 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 especially now with the internet, people are really good about getting feedback, and you go to some of these. Well, messages. the internet's a place where people bitch about things. Let's yeah. just be honest there. Well, I mean, it's good for spotting the flaws because you know, mm-hmm. like uh, uh, back in the three point X days, you know, three point e three point oh and three point five of D and D, there's the character optimization boards, uh, and so that's where people make pun pun the you know the demigod kobold or whatever else, and you could see how pe- broke people could make things, and then just they like, they build them and then say. Now just imagine someone was playing that. Yeah. How fucked would you be? Pretty fucked. So, yeah. yeah. On a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being not fucked at all, and 10 being she didn't, like, you just left your leaves sore. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, was making sex jokes there, Ross. I figured that out. That was, yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't tell. You, like, your face remained completely unchanged. It's, it's, uh, it's my poker face. I see. Yes. Um, Too bad you don't play poker. No. I play, I just listen to Lady Gaga. Because I that's, no, you don't. No. Um, all right. So, anyways, uh, if you have any questions about game design issues, or you have stories, you uh, wish to tell, yeah, uh, feel free to email us. We'll uh, uh, post on here. Uh, we'll be happy to, to go yeah. over them. Ross will read them in the announcer voice, just for you. Yes. So, uh, of course, next up we have Tom's uh, story. Story, and then we have shoutouts. <laughs> All right, well, there's nothing written down here. This is just me, but uh, but actually about a week ago, I, like, getting my annual physical, like, what was it? it I I just, there was discovered a place on my back that could only be described as a lump. And uh, I know what you're thinking, like, oh, God, Tom has cancer and he's going to die now and Ross is going to be left alone in this cruel world all alone. Well, that is true. If that had happened, Ross would be lost without me. No comment. Exactly. <laughs> but no, fortunately, it was just a cyst. So that was, that was actually about that was two days ago when I discovered what that was. So I was sent, I was, today was supposed to be my first appointment with the, uh, he was getting a consultation from the surgeon. So I go in there, and the nurse looks at it and says, you know, we could probably just pop that out right now. So I, ha- I had my very first experience day of a surgical procedure while I was fully conscious. And uh, let me tell you, I don't recommend doing that for just fun. But yes, they cut a, they cut a very infected cyst out of my back today. This is what was going on when I should have been writing my letter. I thought I would have some time during the consultation and afterwards, but no, I was on my back. I was on my stomach for about 30 minutes getting this fucking thing cut out, but that's what I've been doing. And I know I have a very nice picture of it, which I'm going to, I'm going to put up on the side for everyone to see. Yeah. Well, that is a clickable link cause it's not safe for work. So no, uh, no, it's squeamish. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't click on it. Don't just don't. Yeah. Cause it, it looks like it's you'd... pretty gross. It's yeah. out of focus too. Well, it was shot. It was a cell phone cam shot. You can still focus those, Tom. I I did focus, Ross. I have a, I have an old, I have an old fo- cell phone. You, it, mine is older, so I don't know. No one cares, Ross. <laughs> I know because I have a crappy cell phone. <laughs> but dude, I mean, that's almost that's almost more interesting. It's like a blurry, gross thing out, slightly out of focus. So, given that you're a fan of body horror, David Cronenberg, and all that, so uh, what was what were you feeling? What was it like? To- well, I will actually say, uh, I'm sure there are pe- listeners out there that have had stuff like this done. Yeah, probably. but it's a new experience for me. So, I would say the worst by far was actually the numbing shots, because I don't know what that crap is they're putting in there, but. The needle, it hurts, but it burns when it goes in there. I mean, and eventually you stop feeling it, but 
it's not so much the pain afterwards, it's just the jerking and tugging you start feeling. And um, it was even worse, though. The way I was laying on the table, the way the sun was coming in through the window, I could kind of see, I couldn't see, the. I just could just see the surgeon's weight from the waist down, but I could see the shadows of him working. I could actually make out the in- instruments in his hands via shadows on his shirt. So I was like, and my head was kind of stuck there, and I was actually up there watching is going on through like a shadow pipe. It was like it was like shadow boxing, but it was shadow surgery. Nice, nice. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> so these, I could actually imagine a whole surgery scene shot in shadow. So they were tugging pretty hard, huh? Yeah, to get all of it out. Wow. And it's yeah, as I said, it's it was very infected. So there was a lot of. And they kept, and actually, and the, the the really surreal thing was, it was the nurse, the surgeon, and like the surgical student. Yeah. And they were just having inane conversation about shit while this was going on. Yeah. Just you know, discussing uh, like yeah, like the new coffee down the you know, down in the cafeteria sucks. I don't know who they got. And this whole time, as I'm just, I was watching shadow surgery as they're discussing coffee. You know, uh, the car his wife was, the, his wife got that was a piece of crap. And I don't know what it was, just. Like, okay, yeah, car. Oh, that's something really stringy attached to that thing. I don't want. No, I don't. I I can't. I help but look at this. <laughs> and then, of course, then occasionally, that suddenly he would talk to me and say, "Yeah, a lot of this stuff really has a consistency of toothpaste that we're pulling out here." Like, thank you, thank you. That's uh. <laughs> or then he he starts describing it like food. Yeah. He says like, "Oh, very like very cottage cheese like substance coming ooh, out here." Like, ooh, oh, good. Out of all the foods to use, ah, uh, I know. And I don't want is, anything. I like cottage. cottage. I like cottage you cheese. You liked. Cottage no, cheese. no, I'm pretty sure the power is still enough that I still like really? it. Really? Wow. And then, of course, and then, um, then suddenly, you know, then I start hearing what sounds like a staple. Yeah. Like this, like, the thing is, like, sometimes I almost want like to know. a staple gun? No, like a stapler. Oh, a stapler. I see. But, you know, it's, there are times, actually, I just wish, like, how about you just inform me what you're doing now so I'm not freaking the fuck out? <laughs> like, you know, sometimes, no, I, I want to know. I want to know. So... You know they, you know, so finally it's done. You say, uh, and then you know, then I start hearing the wondrous sound of gauze and tape being done, which means they're covering it up. Yeah, yeah. And then they say, okay, you can, you know, hop up now. Like, I'm not gonna be hopping up. <laughs> like, I'm on my stomach on this surgical table. So like, I finally get up, and I, you know, she, they hand me my shirt, and I turn around, and the surgeon basically just bolted out of the room as soon as it was done. Yeah. So it's just me, the nurse, and then looking over and. Everything they had just done was still on the tray. Yeah. So I got to see all the bloody gauze, the little, you know, the, the tool, the surgical tools that, that were now like covered in my blood. And there in all of its glory was the cottage cheese laden substance that was my cyst. That is what I shot a picture of. And it, made it I'm sure it, I'm sure it felt like cottage cheese, but it's very yellow and infection crap. Um, yeah, I could describe it. I, I mean, Tom had shown me the photo because he... he I, I offered, and Ross said, okay. Yes. Ross could have said no. Yes. I could describe it. I it actually There were comparisons I thought of, but I, I don't want to gross people out. Or I, I don't know. Do you care if I... Just, no, no. Uh, yeah, you give them a, yeah, tantalize them. <sighs> Sweet and sour chicken. First thing popped in my head. You are eating that anytime soon? No, no. But <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, ever since RJ described it as uh, uh, chicken with gravy... It's been a, I've had a hard time eating cashew chicken or sweet and sour chicken. It's a valid point. It is a valid point. Yeah. So uh, I like. By the way, in case so, you didn't know, thanks we, RJ. Well, in case you know, we in Springfield, Missouri, have our very own spe- style of cashew chicken. Yeah. And it's uh, chicken with gravy. It's delicious, but it's not Chinese food. Well, no, it's American Chinese food, so yeah, that goes without saying, Tom. So. Well, it's like Springfield, Missouri, American yeah. Chinese food. Yeah. But. No, that's what that's what I did today. So, yeah, we're gonna put the picture up there, yeah. and you can look at it and then lose your lose your appetite for Chinese food, yeah, or yeah. cottage cheese if you like it. Do you gonna watch any of those David Cronenberg movies with the new appreciation? You yes, know, I am. Actually. Or, or something like that. Well, it's it brings me to a point that my friend David actually put home to me is he you know he could watch scene you know he could watch scenes uh, we were watching Hellraiser two. Yeah, and all scenes like the chains fl- coming out, ripping flesh off that perfectly fine. But in Hellraiser two, there's a scene of brain of brain surgery. That's what he couldn't watch. Oh. you know, you know, like bodies being ripped apart by demons. All that that's fine. But 
just an actual sterile surgery scene. And I, I agree. I think a sterile surgery scene is way more creepy than a scene of just a body getting torn apart by chains or whatever. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, everybody has their own little uh, phobia. But no, the, or, the, the, uh, the body horror screen. realizes that you know, it's not hard to get horror from the human body. No, no. Um, yeah, very interesting experience you had there. God bless you, dude. I mean, I had a, I had my wisdom teeth taken out last fall, but that was just... And the worst thing was hearing the, the drills and everything inside my, my face. You yeah, know? actually, uh, in 1994, yeah. I had all four of mine pulled. and yeah. Actually, I, I fell asleep. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get a whole lot of sleep the morning before. So when they put the, the local stuff in, I just... I was out. Yeah. Uh, and my mother was quite worried about me getting back home because... Even at in, at age at age fourteen, I was like six foot one and you know, like two hundred and ninety pounds even yeah. back then. So they said, "There's if I passed out, there's no way she was getting me out of the car." Ah, uh, I see. I bet I bet you were a man. Like like yeah, I, you had all four of them pulled. You were eating corn on the cob that afternoon, weren't you? No, I was. Uh, uh, take a bunch of painkillers and watch Mystery Science Theater two thousand and slept on the couch. Yeah, how badly did your cheeks swell up? I don't know. You saw me. Uh, they didn't look too bad. Yeah. Yeah. I was like a freaking chipmunk. Yeah. It's, my mother, that's what my mother called me for most of that week. I had a lot of pudding. I remember that. Putty, putty. Anyways, yes, putty, putty. Uh, all right. So when we get back, we'll have uh, anecdotes, some, sh- well, some shout outs, anecdote, and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, we so, already uh, took a break, man. Yeah. Well, we'll have another break. It's like the letters. It's We're having it. An- we never had another break, Ross. Yeah, we did. We always put a break in between the beginning and the end of your letters. Do we? Yes. Do I we edit really? all... Do you not listen to the own episodes after they're recorded, Tom? You don't, it's do not you? one. I, it's not one I pay attention to. Yeah, I know. You were like, what, me, me, me. <laughs> oh, other things. Uh, me, 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 me. <laughs> I learned it from watching you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll be right back. We fight, we fuck, we steal Loud and locks and nose unreal 121, always run Don't give shit, don't give fuck And we're back Great music that I haven't picked out yet Well, that you will I, be I could visualize it in my head, yeah. man See, what happens is I We record the episode Then I find a song to play for the episode So I don't know what the song is It's a surprise for all of us But you, the listener, will already know Because I have chosen a button It's, it's very, very complex Layers upon layers Layers upon layers uh, so yeah, we're now at shout outs. We have some things to shout yeah. out about. I think we should probably get the, the, uh, big one right out of the way. Yeah. 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 Ross and I, uh, well, actually Ross invited me last week to first to watch it. Like, Hey, you want to watch this movie? Yeah. Which I never even heard of <laughs> a movie called rubber. Yes. And, uh, I looked at, I mean, Ross told me a little bit about it, but I, then I looked at myself and, it's, and I heard a killer, a tire that kills people with telekinetic powers. Yeah. Well, they had me at hello there, but <laughs> I went there. I had no idea just how brilliant this actually was. Yeah. It, I mean, Ross, I mean, when, when Ross told me that when the first time he saw it, he was just mesmerized for the first five to six minutes. I was too, I discovered. Yeah. You can't, I, and we can't even spoil it for you. No, because that's no. the better. I mean, we're going to talk about it, but we can't really talk much about the actual film itself because it's one of those movies you're better in uh, the less you know about it. So. Yeah, don't like don't even watch the trailer if you can if you can. What we're gonna do, we're gonna link to the video. There's a video on demand version of it. You can get it from the website, so you can watch it now. You just have to. Uh, but if you can find it at a theater, yeah. Even if there's an art house theater in your town, like you know, we have the Moxie here in Thank Springfield, Missouri. Yes. Um, but if you can watch it now, uh, watch it in a theater, it's great because again, you really for for reasons that you will understand when you see the movie, you really want it to be as close to Plato's cave as possible. You really want to be in a darkened environment, no distractions, just you and it, because it is a thing of well, YouTube. I mean, first of all, I'll say it's you know I was expecting some really stupid indie, you know, like not indie but B movie. Yeah, Roger Corman. Yeah, and or the room. First of all, I mean, I will, I, I will just say I will just mention technical things. But I won't give anything away, but yeah, I mean, first of all, it's shot on professional film. Yeah, yeah. professional cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a professional crew, sound. Uh, the director, actors, actors are good. The actors are professional and good. Um, 
The director is actually a French uh, uh, guy who's mostly known as a DJ. Is Mr. Ozu? That's his DJ name. Uh, some of his music's in the movie. Yeah. Uh, so is also Justice. If you've heard of them, mm-hmm. um, they uh, contributed one or a few tracks. So yeah, the music is great. Very, of course, kind of house music, which. It's an interesting choice. Uh, but it works. Yeah, it works. It does work. Um, but yeah, there's nothing – it's not like – people might compare it to The Room because it kind of gives you that same what the fuckness. But it's a totally different thing because in The Room, it's accidental. Like the guy tried to make a drama and he wound up making a comedy. In, in Rubber, everything is by the director's intent. This is the, the director's vision of what he wanted on screen. And so – and um, there it is. There is no, there are no accidents. There are no mistakes. Everything is there on purpose. So that that's important to keep in mind. Um, so yeah. Also, no reason. No reason. No uh, reason. No reason. <laughs> uh, so you really do need to watch it. Uh, the, we'll have the link to the video on demand thing, so you can just watch it now. And it is magnifique. Yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, so much so that we watched it twice in one week. Yeah, at the theater, paying money to see it. <laughs> I, I reiterate, Ross paid money to watch a movie twice in one week. Yeah. Ross, paying money. I underline that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm not saying Ross is guilty of piracy or anything. No more than you are, Tom. Yes, we're in this together, aren't we? Well, yeah, okay. well we're if, not. If, if we're one goes down, citizens. If one goes we've down. We've just emphasized how much we do pay for movies we yeah. enjoy, so we're not but pirates if, at all. Yeah. If one of us goes down, the other will follow. Yeah, well, that wouldn't happen because we aren't. Because we, well, we have a murder. In a, an entirely hypothetical that's situation, true. yes. Yes, I would drag everyone around me down to hell. But And you know, that's hypothet- not- hypothetically, we have a murder-suicide pact. No, we don't. Dude. Well, you might have a murder, but it's not a You pact. still haven't signed it yet? <laughs> no, I don't even know what you're talking about. Uncool. <laughs> that is uncool, Ross. Get some cis cut out of your 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 face. Yeah, see what I did there. You know, you know, certain kinds of acne can become cystic. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so imagine lost. moving that the cut is cheese crap out of your face, Ross. Imagine that. The new David Cronenberg movie. <laughs> cut um, is cheese face. Daphne. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, someone's gonna make that. You know, probably. Um, anyways, actually, I'd like to mention another movie um, that actually hasn't been released yet, but uh, I talked to the director. Um, there's a movie called Linotype. It's about the Linotype machine, which is a uh, uh, typesetting machine used from the 1880s to about 1960. Um, very Probably one of the world incredibly massive, complex, noisy machine. Yeah, um, actually, um, Elvin Swires, I think, the company uh, downtown on, uh, I think it's College Street. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're the ones, they do all the ballots for Springfield elections. I I got to deliver there one time. They actually yeah. have one of them, one of those in there. Oh my God. I mean, they it? don't use it, but it's yeah. like, they they have it in their main lobby is just a, uh, it's an like, a, like an antique relic. I see. Interesting. Uh, well, anyways, a local guy in Springfield, Doug Wilson, uh, was making the documentary. He raised $24,000 on Kickstarter. I talked to him recently at a Missouri Film Alliance meeting. We were talking about Kickstarter because, you know, I've used it for RPPR, the, the ransoms. Um, and it, I'm a graphic design nerd, as you will see in Zombies of the World. I, I'm not like, it's true. I'm not like a super professional. I please do not. I'm barely, I'm self-taught. I don't know. I barely have any idea of what I'm doing. Uh, but I am envious of those who are very good at it. Doug Wilson is, and he has a, uh, cool film that will, I'm looking forward to whenever it comes out, we will have to, uh, do another review of it or whatever. Cause I like documentaries about obscure, niche, nerdy, graphic design things. So. Yeah. Ross's nerd credentials are in good order. Yeah, I'm a nerd about many things. Not just video games and tabletop games, but, you know, obscure, obsolete graphic yeah. design Body stuff. horror. Right? Yeah, body, or body horror. There, see, there, there you go. Um, Tom, you had a, 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 actually a, a, a something more mainstream thing you wanted to talk about. Yeah, actually, it's this is a video game. And I know, um, yes, by the way, I know when Aaron did a shout-out for Iron Man back when it came Iron out. Iron Man 2, but yeah. Iron Man. Uh, or was it Iron Man? No, it was the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was the first one. And uh, I think Ross actually rolled his eyes. Uh, see, I, we, we uh, just to give the, the, the listeners... Behind the, the scenes. Behind, behind the scenes. scenes. At RPPR, oh, inside the podcaster studio. Um... <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, it's perfectly we, all right. right. For our philosophy for the shout-outs is to talk about things that aren't 
like to highlight things that we think are interesting and cool, but aren't ne- necessarily that you might not have yeah. seen. Now we don't, so we don't talk about the super popular things because super popular things, by definition, usually have multi million dollar marketing budgets. So and like, they don't need our shit. So we like them, but you know, like, uh, like I like you know, like just last week, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give a shout out to the Thor movie, which yeah, just came out exactly, or, or Portal Two, which I've beaten and enjoyed mm. because they can do fine on their own. They don't need yeah. our help. But this game, I'm about to give a shout out to, you know, way back when when I just mentioned it. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, I think it's kind of a mainstream well, game. What is it, Tom? It is Mortal Kombat Nine. Yes, I think it's not actually called Nine, but it's just Mortal Kombat. Yeah, but. I am. This pleases me so much because I have had a long, glory storied history with Mortal Kombat. I loved it from the first one. Second one, I actually won a Springfield based you know, wide tournament for Mortal Kombat three back in Aladdin's castle, if you remember that. And so I loves me some Mortal Kombat, except when it started getting all three D. You know, then suddenly the battlefield shifts around, and I can't tell what the fuck I'm doing. It's this one actually goes back to its 2D roots. It's once again like it like it was in the arcade, but it, now it has you know current gen graphics and sound, and all the characters and of course like the X ray shots which you can pull off as a combo. You know, all this stuff it is and the, and another great thing I noticed about it is that when you like as a fight goes on like the wounds actually stay on the characters. So if you like you know do a really powerful combo that you know uppercut to their face. The bloody, you know, the bloody ch- dripping chin will still be there. I love that shit, and it it's revitalized Mortal Kombat for me. I am very, very happy. about So, are you going to get back into it? Are you going to try and like compete? At I never really left. I st- I still play. Yeah. The, uh, I can't find the arcade games anywhere. Well, obviously. no, no, they all. But come no, on I, like I, I, but I have them all on uh, like one, two, and three. I have on the Super Nintendo. Right. And that's actually pretty damn close. Well, I mean, are you going to get like start trying to do be competitive? Is what I'm saying. Yeah, actually, I was. I, I well, I don't know if you ever, ever did that. You know, the arcade, the uh, you would go you go to Aladdin's Castle a lot. Yeah, well, a few times as a kid. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know if you ever noticed. There's actually there's a protocol that went to playing the Mortal Kombat games. Right. There was usually one or two of this. Usually one or two of them there, but like two people would be playing, and there'd be like twelve people around waiting. And if someone wanted to claim the space, you put a token on the on the console. To do, to New York Kate, I play winner. Right, and uh, that's I was uh, definitely among that crowd back then. Right, but yes, if if uh, I I mean I've only I played it when it's been on display at Best Buy, only so. But now I'm actually thinking of now getting a 360 or something and getting so, back into it. Okay, so um, and now I have a question for the listeners at home. Would you be if Tom does this? Uh, would you be interested if for us to go to the trouble of putting up a live stream? Or like on Justin.tv or something like that to see Tom as he uh, uh, relearns the ropes of Mortal Kombat and uh, tries to get back into the swing of things. Uh, and possibly hear some Tom commentary talking about him uh, 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 fighting on Xbox Live yeah. or something like that. Uh, my, uh, that might, you know, my comment, commentary might end up being kind of like we did in that fake run through we did of Left 4 Dead. Yeah, yeah. Fucking shit. Fucking shit. Fucking shit. Yeah. So right. you, the listeners, would you be interested in that? Because would you like is, to hear me going crazy? Yes, uh, uh, and of course, I'm also thinking about possibly doing some other streaming of like Killing Floor or Magicka or other games in which I am a jackass, which is most multiplayer games. So touche, good sir. Yes, I actually do role playing on them. I role play a serial killer. Nice. That which is every FPS ever you see. Yeah, no, Russ. I think what you need, what you need to do is do the uh, do do what you did for the undead plant that was attacking us. Yes. That's oh, a, dude. It's like, dude. Uh, <laughs> that's a, I'm going uh, to kick your ass. Yes. Uh, but you see, I role play serial kill. I just hunt out and kill whoever I can find. Which... So you're, but you're more of an opportunity killer. Yeah, exactly. So, All right. Fair see, enough. See, that was a joke. I, was I see. I heard that joke. Yes. I didn't laugh because it wasn't funny. No. Anyway, um, another video game. In fact, speaking of Magicka, I would like to give a shout out to Magicka Vietnam, the first DLC for Magicka. Uh, there are guns in it. You shoot goblins with M16s and uh, uh, AK-47s, and there's a napalm strike spell. Hmm. You throw a colored yeah. uh, colored smoke grenade, and then it throws a big napalm strike. Yeah, it's like, so it's like it's like platoon with goblins and magic spells. Yeah. So yes, like, sir, the goblins are over here. We're pulling back. Where are you going to pull it back to, son? Exactly. Uh, it's quite fun. I've had quite a bit of fun uh, playing it. Uh, there's also two other DLC contents now for Magicka, the Marshlands and the Caverns. Uh, I haven't tried those yet. I've tried the Marshlands. There's zombies in that one. That one's fun. 
<laughs> you can't see my face. Just, yeah, he, he's just like, ugh. Like, really, Ross? Really? You zombies. Should, you're surprised, yeah. Um, Even zombies would do that. Yes, exactly. Like, uh, dude, the guy needs to tone it down. Uh, oh, two other movies. Um, Tucker and Dale versus Evil and Hobo with a Shotgun. I saw both of them recently. Actually, I, I've, I've seen that. You show me the trailers for them. Yes. And uh, I, I I like what I see about both of them, but particularly, uh, you know, Tucker and Dave versus yeah, yeah the DVD for Hobo with the Shotgun is not out yet it is on available on video on demand so uh, we'll put a link out to that uh, they're both great they're both entertaining uh, very gory funny uh, Tucker Dale versus Evil you see what critical fumbles do to you you tax a somebody lot. yeah very like fall in a wood chipper whoops uh, um, and Hobo with the Shotgun that's the, if, the, if the title doesn't sell it for you Right, yeah. You might need to be electro. Do I really need to go any further? You it's, might need to be electro. Shot. Rutger Howard is the fucking hobo. Rutger motherfucking Howard. Exactly. Um, let's see here. Oh, you had another one that you wanted to mention? Uh, yes, actually. Um, I know I'm probably going to get crucified for this. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. I'm actually giving a shout out to a fanfic. Fan fiction. Well, whatever. To, for those who are not illuminated. Yes, a fan fiction. So please elucidate us, Tom. I think you might want to go back later and review what you just said. But Elucidate? Whatever. Yes. That's a word, Tom. Well, yes, I know. <laughs> but anyway, no, this one is actually, it's a Mass Effect uh, fan fiction mm-hmm. uh, called Spirit of Redemption. It's on fanfic- fanfiction.net. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the the author's name is like, uh, like is that Mir- Miratel or something? I can't. Son of a bitch, I'm giving a shout out for it. And I can't fucking remember it. That's, that's difficult, Tom. Fucking. But Spirit of Redemption is the title. Mm-hmm. And I, because it's going on for like 71 chapters now mm-hmm. and there's, I mentioned it because a, the story is great, which is a rarity on that site and many others. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, of course, you know, we've read such gems as I want to go on the spaceships, daddy. Yes. Uh, doom repercussions of evil. Yes. The classic. Yes. And, Times. uh, or, uh, full life consequences. But this one's actually, the yeah, story's great, like and there's actually grammar, mm-hmm. sentence structure, like she, proofs, she proofreads it, and there's coherent sentences and narrative structure. Mm-hmm. And it just, it really stands out, and it's one that it's, may, may I be vulgar here for a second, Ross? Uh, no. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, fine. I thoroughly enjoy this story. It pleases me greatly, and I, it, on that side, there's not many stories that grab my attention and keep them. Yeah, this would have been so much better if you would let me be vulgar. <laughs> but I'm just surprised you you like. I was asking permission. I thought I'd be diplomatic once. I know. I'm just surprised that you you obeyed. I mean, I, don't get I, don't get used to it. Yeah, I know. Definitely I'm, don't get used I'm, to it. I don't know what to make of this. I, I actually did. I said, you know, okay, one time when Ross tells me asks me tells me something, I'll listen. Yeah. Just once today, I owe him. Yeah. One thing he tells me to do, I'll actually do it. Yeah. That was it. Oh. I hope you. I hope you savored the flavor because it sure as shit won't happen again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, definitely. Yeah. Spirit of Redemption, very good fanfic. I, if you're into that sort of thing, I encourage you to read it. All right. Um, and then, uh, uh, of course, uh, no, one other video game, Mafia Two. Uh, just played. I've it. heard of it. Never yeah. played it, but uh, a sequel to Mafia. Uh, it's a really? GTA yes, sandbox game set in post World War II. Uh, you know the 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 rise of a young gangster as he works his way up. Nothing like The Godfather, right? Um, oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, no, no, that's unfair because uh, Michael Corleone was in was the son of the head of the family. That's yeah. hardly working his way up. I got it on Steam, uh, you know, when it was on sale for like eighty percent off and uh, I put ten hours into it. It's a fun game. Um it's not like GTA. If you run a red light you actually can get pulled over and arrested or fined. But no uh like, Cars no, handle realistic. Come on no 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 no. You get pulled over by a cop, you have a shotgun, you kill the cop and keep going. Yeah, well then that's not quite how it works out in the game. I, I just burned through the uh, uh story game, but uh yeah, it's a fun eight, ten hours. It's it's a very much like a cinema it's very cinematic. Real, lots of cutscenes, lots of interaction uh mm-hmm. between you and the other NPCs. Uh really good voice acting, so you know, it's yeah. if you can get it cheap, I would recommend it. Uh, actually, I think I should go back to mention the last thing I did. Yeah. Actually, she wrote two. She has two stories on there. Okay. One's a Spirit of Truth, and the, the one I mentioned was actually the continuation of that previous one. 
Spirit of Redemption? And yeah, Spirit of Truth was the first part of Spirit of Redemption. I see. They're both really well written, but I can also tell that she improved greatly from between between the you know writing one and then going into the other. I see. All right. Um, and it it drew me in like a triple cunted hooker. Okay. There, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> that would have been funny, but now not so much. I see. Well, it, you it, should have let me be vulgar when I wanted to be vulgar, Ross. <laughs> that's I got to be there to re- reel you in, right? You know, bring you down. Um. And then finally, uh, I would like to mention The Unspeakable Oath. I know we've given a shout-out to before. The reason I mention that is because I am working with Shane Ivey and Torrent Atkinson of the uh, uh, the Hillside Thickets um, to the Darkest Thickets, uh, the band, the Lovecraftian uh, uh, band. Um, and I'm sure I, I got their name wrong. <laughs> but the, we're saw. doing a podcast about Call of Cthulhu, The Unspeakable Oath, uh, Delta Green, all kinds of great stuff. We're working on it right now, uh, doing it online via Skype. Although Skype just got bought up by Microsoft today, so yeah, for uh, really, like, Skype's going away. Eight, Skype's going to suck. An eight, oh my an, god! An eight billion dollar deal. Eight point five billion. And I believe it was initially sold for two billion to yeah. the investors that currently that owned it before. Yeah. Uh, so it's the value has risen. Yeah, a, a, a little out of proportion of what it's actually worth, like quite a bit. Well, I think Microsoft. I think they uh, Microsoft just threw down an offer and they saw it, and it was twice what anybody like Google and Facebook both ordered from what I've read, something around four billion dollars for that, which for Skype is a lot, and then eight billion is just eight point five billion is well, just ridiculous. Do you remember the Simpsons? Anyways. Do you remember the Simpsons episode where Mr. Burns sold the nuclear power plant to the Germans? Yeah, yeah exactly. And he got like you know way more than it was worth, yeah. and he starts you know just like you know whooping for like a minute. And I suddenly accept your offer. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm sure that's what was going. On. I'm sure that was going on in the, in the halls of. Skype. So, anyways, we're doing this over Skype. Yeah, it's people old. When we get closer to having it ready, uh, we'll of course put it out online. Uh, I'll put some notice here, and uh, yeah. So to keep a look at that, and finally, of course, uh, Dread because we finally actually managed to get to play Dread, so that'll lead to our anecdote. So, Dread is a game where you use Jenga instead of dice. Uh, and so, Tom, why don't you tell about that? Because I ran that for your birthday. Yeah, yeah, thirty-one, and to celebrate. Uh, Ross ran a game where only Jason showed up. Thank you, Jason. Well, everybody else, yeah, I tried to get other people, and everybody else was a douche that day. Yeah. But no, Ross ran a very nice scenario about werewolves. Uh, it's called Beneath the Full Moon. It's one of the scenarios in Dread. Uh, you can also get it online for free at the, or the scenario mm-hmm. at Tilting at Windmills. But, anyway, sorry. I will say that uh, it's a horror game, obviously, where uh, I love it. Character creation, you just you uh, answer questions, and the questions, there's no telling what questions you're going to get depending on what sheet you get, which I like that very much. But what I mainly like is there's no die rolling. Everything is res- all the conflicts are resolved with a Jenga tower. And let me tell you, die rolling, you think that shit generates tension? Fuck that. A Jenga tower will fucking have everyone on edge. And f- especially since Jason was a freaking ninja when it came to the Jenga tower. Yeah, it turns out one of Jason's hidden talents is that he's a fucking god of Jenga. Apparently, played... I think this is to make up for his die rolling in a lot of our games. Yeah, exactly. He sucks at rolling dice, but he's a god at Jenga. So, uh, yeah. Uh... Yeah, it, so, I mean, the game was really fun, but ma- Jenga, the Jenga tower is brilliant, for, especially for a horror game with tension. Because, you know, like, you know, everyone, like, I don't know, I don't know how it would be in a larger group, but with Jason and I, everyone was dead quiet when we were making the pull that never happens in our role-playing games there's always noise going on but this time you could hear a pin drop and you know that or like and you know like slowly working the piece out and like you know like we're all out of our seats even ross was just like looking there like then it starts to wiggle like oh oh <laughs> and you know that of course jason just like that didn't oh. well of course you no know, he started at the freaking bottom so there's like there's you know there is like one Jenga piece left on the, like the bottom three layers, and the thing was still standing. Yeah, no, Jason was a dick also by doing that. He was just like, I'm gonna make it harder for Tom. Doop, pull it from the bottom. And the whole time it's like just like, ha, ha, ha. yeah. No, it really does need. Uh, the thing is though, it really does need a full group of five or six players because with two players it's over pretty quickly. Because the thing about Dread is when you fail a pull. Uh, because just to admit, to to explain the game, your players, your your character's taken out of play. Yes, uh, if you fail pull and the tower goes over, you, your character's pulled out of play, which means they usually die, or they have, or they you know they have to le- they go crazy or something like that. Or in our case, you know, became a werewolf. Right. Um. So 
in uh, uh, with two players, that means it's over pretty quickly because Tom was the one. You, it was you. You you you're, you knocked the Jenga tower. Over. I did. You did. So your character became a werewolf because I wasn't Jason. Yeah. Uh, and I Jason, I gave him in like ten more pulls to escape to safety, but he's like, oh, "I'm a boss." Yeah, but we did. There was a lot of mentioning of like a boss in that game. Yes, Jason. Jason was like a boss in that one respect. So uh, yeah, uh, kudos to him. So yeah, it was a great. So, but still, it was fun for you. Yeah, I mean, I can't wait to play with a bigger group. Yeah, I think we definitely have to play with a larger group because it is shit is ridiculous. Let me tell you, like, and with Jenka, shit gets real really quick. Yeah. Um. So, and I'm looking forward to see if the entire group will go. As silent I just hope as the we people were. who like sell dread at Gen Con they decide to bring some Jenga towers to sell because they make bank on that. Like, get both of them. You know, they didn't. You know, it's just it like. And the Jenga, Jenga towers aren't that pricey. Yeah, like sixteen, seventeen bucks. I take that back. They're way more expensive than I thought they would be. Well, I bought mine new at Toys R Us. They could be cheaper else. Well, it's also probably Toys R Us has a. Mar- is a huge markup. markup yes it's, we're toys rest that's how we make our money by charging huge amounts of money for also i'd like to see you browsing the aisles of toys r us yes they have all kinds of toys there tom yeah i know and video games and i was there games. i was there just the other i was there last monday oh okay all right i was looking for a birthday gift for my grandmother i see okay. trying, to see, trying to see if i can get her an electronic she got her that super soaker yeah i was trying to find an electronic blackjack game she could play ah i see well, uh, I didn't find anyway. One. Okay, they discontinued Thanks. those damn things. Thank you. All right. Just in case anyone's noticing, yeah, if you're trying to find like a new electronic <laughs> blackjack game, <laughs> you are <laughs> fuck shit out of luck. We're a little out of uh, a little t- tangent there. Um, so, anyways, this has been RPPR episode fifty-seven. Read the fri- fine print. Hope we've uh, uh, read some of that you. for you. Yeah, enlightened you about game design flaws. By the way, uh, I'll say for fine print, wouldn't stretchable paper be useful? You know, just kind of stretch it out so you can have all the words are stretched out and you can see them. And yeah. it just goes right back. Uh, yeah, if that was feasible, economically I, feasible to do. If it was, you could make a you could make bank on that. Yeah, that's a free idea from Dom. So anyways, uh, this is Ross Payton. And, this, and, and I'm Tom. And we... With uh, him, because he needs me. See you next time. <laughs>